Natural Resources University is pleased to introduce one of our newest series, Working Wild You, hosted by Alex Few and Jared Beaver. What it's like to catch a wolf. It is quite energizing. Welcome back to The Working Wild You, a show where we explore what it means to share the working landscape with people and wildlife. I'm Jared. And I'm Alex. And today's story is going to be a bit up close and personal. We're going to share stories of what happens when wolves and people get a little too close for comfort. And this hits a little close to home for you, right, Alex? It does. When your husband's been bitten by a wolf... You see, Alex's husband, as a wildlife capture specialist, knows a thing or two about what it means to get up close and personal with wolves. Yeah, I was asking him just the other day what this scar was on his arm, and he was like, yep, that's where I was bitten by a wolf. And a few weeks ago, I sat on our porch with Grant to hear some of the stories from his glory days. So can you tell me what you used to do for work and introduce yourself? Uh, Grant Kedwallader. I had a job working for a contracted company for the Game and Fish and Park Services to catch wild animals. The Wildlife Capture Company would be contracted by state wildlife agencies who need to capture wildlife, including wolves, for research and population monitoring. He's gone all over the West doing this work. And now he runs our family farm, which makes me a lot more comfortable. I bet aviation accidents related to animal capture or survey work is the number one cause of death for wildlife field biologists. Tell me what it's like to capture a wolf that is not tranquilized. What it's like to catch a wolf. It is quite energizing. days in advance knowing I'm going to that job, there will be an excitement over me. And and I know that the whole time that you need to attack, because the fear of a wolf when you're going to capture a wolf will also cause problems. You cannot hesitate and you have to be full on and full go. I have to say, having captured both deer and bears during my career, whether it's use of chemical immobilization, drop nets, or helicopter and net gun, There's nothing as exhilarating in my work as successfully capturing and releasing an animal in the name of science. And these methods applied to wolves may be the most heart-pumping part of the whole deal. We used helicopters and we would shoot net guns and deploy a net over the top of the wolf to slow them down and somewhat subdue them until we could get on the ground afoot and then restrain them. Well, ideally what we're looking to do is put a muzzle on them and then hobble their legs so we can then run all the tests. All the tests. Wildlife biologists need information about body size, body condition. Basically, how fat an animal is can be an indicator of overall health. They also draw blood to look for disease and measure genetic diversity. There's really a lot of data that can be gathered each time an animal is captured. And as a, as a mugger, A mugger is a wrestler, the member of the team that's up close and personal with the animals getting their hands dirty. And people who are typically good at this job tend to have been on their high school wrestling team or have spent a lot of time wrestling calves at brandings. As a mugger, you want to you want to hit them with that and get them stuck and try to get them stopped and immediately follow it up with your hands and all your body weight get your weight on them and get their legs, keep their legs off of the ground. So there's a moment when they first get their hands on the wolf when things can get a little interesting. That's their bubble. Uh, It's when they're going to fight. And not always would they fight. Um, I had some what I think were subordinates. They were usually smaller in size, 60 pounds, 70 pounds, um, we tried to never get really young ones. And those, sometimes I've, I've gone all the way up to them without a fight at all. Um, seems like the, the bigger the size you get, the bigger the fight that's in them. And it's the, the older they are, the more dominant they are in their pack, and, and 
they show their dominance and they they're ready to fight they protect you know it's their job their livelihood i guess and when you get those feisty ones in the net well that makes the capture process a little bit more interesting because if he sees me put this muzzle on he's gonna be chomping because they everything they see they they want to bite they probably think they're fighting for their life realistically they don't know it but we're just gonna let them go they're gonna be happy and they're gonna have little jewelry what's the jewelry part oh the jewelry's for any other biologist to you know monitor what they need to know and then we pull samples like blood and hair sometimes whiskers and take measurements sometimes weights and you know any other data so i want to take a moment to stress a couple of points here Modern advances in capture and animal handling has come a long ways in reducing the stress and risk of mortality imposed on an animal. And a lot of this is acknowledging that public awareness, values, and sensitivity to an individual animal's welfare has changed. So any capture protocol has to make sure they are as safe as possible from an animal's perspective. So Grant got to capture and handle a lot of wolves. And when you're flying in helicopters, netting wolves with net guns, and quickly jumping out to pacify and immobilize them, some things are bound to get a little hairy. So anyway, he did a great shot. I got out and I hung my harness on the door as I was getting out. And that can throw off your whole dynamic of what was going on. By the time I had to climb back in the helicopter to get my weight off of my harness that had hooked, and when I did and got unhooked finally, I feel like I'm 10 miles behind now. And I know how hard it is to catch these wolves and how hard it is to keep them in a net. I should have been there already and I'm already feeling panic. So I, I do, I blow out of that helicopter, I drop to the ground. Well, when I hit the ground, The wolf was rolling down the mountain with the net on and completely had unrolled from the net and landed directly into my lap with no net on. And it was was like I made it in the nick of time to land there to get this present of a wolf in my lap in about three foot of snow. And I had sunk waist deep in this snow and I get this wolf with no net right here in my chest. So I grabbed a hold of him immediately. But the nice thing is, I think the tumbling in that snow, he couldn't see. He didn't quite know where to bite yet. And I'd already had a hold of him. Everything went good after that. I had him. It was really easy to, well, there was no net to take off. So it was quite easy to gear up. But sometimes unplanned scrambling turns out quite a bit different and things can go south. We got in on a pack of wolves. One of the other guys made a shot. With a net gun. I got out on that wolf, and he, was, he wasn't overly big, a 100-pound wolf, 95 pounds. And, but he, 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 he got me. He somehow got flipped around and got, he bit me right in my chest. Um, one of the other capture guys says he bit your heart. But that's right where he got a hold of my vest. And the funny thing is, is my push to talk so I could communicate and call for help is right what he bit. And so there, w- there was no calling for help and I was afraid to touch him and do anything because he was so close to my face. I just knew he was gonna bite my face. I mean, and so I, all I could do is I just constantly kept backing up as he was dragging on me and I just had my arms laid wide open just and not touching him at all and just kind of trying to look away. Out of the corner of my eye, re- we made really good eye contact a couple times, but I just didn't like it. If you've ever seen a wolf, they have these beady, staring eyes, and it's just like, I have no trust in what you're doing next. And you know, he probably felt the same about me, but he finally let go. I went right back for that net again, tripped him up and got him down, and, and the whole thing had a happy ending. But there for a little bit, it uh, was quite, quite drama. It was, That's the part of getting after something that's just completely alive and not darted. Holy smokes, that's wild stuff. And this is what wildlife management can look like. And this provides important scientific information. The jewelry Grant talked about, GPS collars, are popular because of their ability to collect large quantities of spatial and temporal data. 
This can provide important information about location and demographics that helps guide recovery efforts by providing a greater understanding of home range and dispersal, by helping to understand habitat use, estimate mortality, really the list just goes on. Great point, Alex. This data is critical for understanding and managing wildlife, but I have to ask, after being bitten, does Grant change now from time to time during the full moon? <laughs> Luckily, no. He does howl at the moon, but only on payday. Payday comes and he's a howling at the moon. But he's my baby. I don't mean maybe. I'm never gonna let him. But Grant does have a pretty good understanding of wolf behavior, particularly when they're in fight or flight. And without the opportunity for flight, they sometimes turn and fight. But these are certainly not normal human-wolf interactions. Because when given the option, when people are out there on the trail, for instance, wolves really prefer fleeing to fighting. They'll get on out of there as fast as possible. So much so that you'll probably never see them. That's right. I know people who've worked as range riders. These are cowboys and cowgirls who use human presence to reduce the potential for conflict between wolves and livestock, and they barely ever see them. And I think it's association by a human. I am a human, and they know what humans are. They're not stupid by any means at all. That's Chet Robertson, who is the range rider for the Big Hole Watershed Committee in southwestern Montana. And I think that they just, they're just they so wound up and nervous that they just want to stay up there and stay hit out. And in 10 years, 11 years, whatever it is, I, I've seen wolves five or six times. But... Don't get us wrong, wolf attacks on humans do happen, just very, very, very infrequently and generally have an underlying cause. Across North America and Europe from 2002 to 2020, a recent study found evidence for only 12 attacks, of which two were fatal. And that's really different than what happened in the last month in Wyoming, where three humans were attacked by grizzlies. Considering that there's close to 60,000 wolves in North America and 15,000 in Europe that share space with millions of people, the risk of wolf attack is above zero, but far too low to even calculate. For comparison, there are far fewer grizzly bears on a landscape, and the chance of being fatally attacked is magnitudes greater than that from a wolf. Something important to note, one of these fatal wolf attacks occurred at a remote mining camp that had a garbage dump frequented by wolves that showed no fear of humans. In other words, these wolves had become habituated, which means they've lost their fear of humans. And when we come back, we'll jump into what happens when wolves become habituated to people and the dangers to us and them. Hey listener, we really appreciate you listening to Working Wild You. And we have a small favor to ask. Please head over to our show notes and fill out the listener survey. We want to learn more about you and what impact this show is having. Your feedback will inform how we make the show in the future and help us obtain funding so we can continue this important work. Thank you. Now back to the show. So habituation is kind of a behavioral process. That's Mike Jimenez, a retired biologist and wolf manager who has worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as with state and tribal management agencies in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. So wolves habituate. If you don't get a negative response over and over again, pretty soon you're not bothered by it. Keeping a healthy fear of humans and wolves is important. It helps keep them out of trouble, whether it's with people or livestock extreme would be a food reward that every time I come near humans man I get a free cooler pretty soon animals like bears or something that's real food oriented go wow this is you know and so that unknown of what's going to happen when you go near humans is dialed down it's like just I don't really get a negative reinforcement here I get food so they keep coming closer and closer at the end of the day when wildlife associate people with food that's never good Animals are driven by natural instinct to eat, so when they associate close proximity to people with food, they will do whatever they need in order to protect what they see as a resource needed for survival. This includes fighting. These situations never end well. But fortunately, we've got wildlife managers who are constantly monitoring and reacting to habituated wildlife. 
it's not something that's going to define, you know, you have to worry about, my God, I'm going to get killed by a wolf. But as a manager, do you decide, do you want to go down that route? What Mike means by that route is lethal control, or killing habituated wolves and wildlife who pose a threat to people. But before lethal control is needed, there are a few tools that managers can try to keep wolves a bit more wild. To go back to the non-lethal stuff that we tried, you have whistles and the sirens going off, lights and everything else to scare them away, flattery, all this stuff. But a lot of this stuff is only effective to a point, because if you use these tools for too long, wolves may become habituated, because wolves are neophobic, meaning they're afraid of new things. And when they get used to something, that fear has gone away. And nothing happens other than, holy crap, what was that? And pretty soon you go, huh, it really isn't that big of a deal. You start habituating or getting used to that stimulus. So when wolves come to town, whether it's non-lethal or lethal, managers often need to take some action. And they left a pack from that Jackson area and moved over a little bit, still in the city limits, into the southern part of town, and started to set up a home range in town. And, and so one side of town, again, do you like wolves, do you don't like wolves, depends how your glasses are. If you like wolves, people thought that was the coolest thing, the greatest thing since sliced bread. And we're gonna show the wolves, how, you know, the rest of the world how to coexist with wolves. This is gonna be cool. God, are we lucky to live here. But not everybody saw it this way. The other side, I got nasty calls, get the stinking wolves out of here, it's your fault. The local safety agencies, police department, sheriff's department, all got involved and people want to know, is there zero risk of wolves causing problems? And I'm like, I can't tell you that. There's no such thing as a zero risk. So in the middle of all this, the agencies had to make a decision. Leave them be or see their presence as a potential threat to people and pets and manage them. How do you get everybody on board saying, there's going to be a lot of bad heat here, a lot of bad press, but you do not want wolves hanging around people's houses. So a dog got nailed. It actually survived, but it got torn up really badly. Um, and it just was this spiral going down. So the, the decision was made, OK, you can go ahead and take them out. So to make a long story short, both wolves were removed. and. The people that like wolves thought it was the most evil thing possible that a federal agency can do. The people that didn't like wolves kind of, you know, good. And, you know, nobody went, great, thanks. For, you know, it, it, you're not going to win friends in wolf management. But wolves becoming habituated to people doesn't just occur in towns like Jackson Hole, Wyoming. That's right. This process can happen even in a part of the West that comes to mind for most people when they think of wilderness our national parks, specifically Yellowstone. Here's Doug Smith, a senior research biologist and head of the Yellowstone Wolf Project, who has also had to adjust to the challenge of managing habituated wolves. We had a pup that grew up right over here behind you, 1273, and he became one of our biggest problem wolves we've ever had. Good stories end, we pounded him many times with non-lethal munitions and bear spray, and he's acting like a wild wolf now. But it took a while, and he stole someone's tripod and ran off with it, and he grew up right over here by a trail. Mm. And so when left unattended by his parents, he and his pack mate pups would run out to the trail. Literally, you're walking down the trail, and here come a bunch of wolf pups. I mean, if you're a visitor, it doesn't <laughs> get any better. And I know firsthand that in Lamar Valley and Yellowstone, there is certainly enough people for wolves to get used to. So wildlife managers spend significant time there, hazing wolves in an attempt to reverse habituation. And they'll use three different phases depending on the level of habituation with the first phase including things such as clapping and yelling and honking at wolves that get too close to the road. If we notice that this behavior is still continuing with the same individual or specifically a pack that we're seeing a lot of that bad behavior, we might move into the second level of hazing. That's Taylor, who is a technician with the Yellowstone Wolf Project. 
which is things like paintballs and bear spray. Um, these are often repeat offenders again, and so obviously at that point we're trying to shoot the wolves with paintballs. It hurts. Um, we want them to experience that pain when doing something bad, like walking into a picnic area and looking for scraps or something like that. In a video Taylor shared with us, her collie is leaping through the brush as he shoots a wolf with a paintball gun, all in the name of reducing habituation. I know this may be hard for some people to hear, but this is an important part of managing wildlife in order to keep animals and people safe. It is very stressful at times because visitors do not enjoy us doing that. They think we're ruining their sighting. They think we're hurting the animal. Yellowstone wolves are the most visible wolves in the world, and we have this opportunity to watch and observe them. Uh, and so when we're paintballing a wolf, it always flee as fast as it can. They're very, very scared of it. Um, tuck tail, uh, just kind of getting out of the area as fast as they can. And if paintballs and bear spray don't work, they'll move to phase three, where they shoot rubber bullets, cracker shells, or bean bags. If they get past the stage where these levels of hazing don't seem to be effective, that's when we might consider them a safety threat. And at that point, we're going to start making that decision if we think we need to lethally remove them from the population. Uh, that's only ever been done two times in 27 and a half years. But at that point, those wolves have usually been fed some sort of human food to get to that level. But just like in Jackson, habituation can be deadly to wolves in more ways than one. It's horrible for us because the wolves get used to people, they get accustomed to them, they get to habituation. Two wolves out of that pack get hit by a car that fall. Can't say that that was due to this situation. My hunch is it is. And we've killed two wolves with rifles in the park because they were too habituated. So we have a very aggressive hazing program if they get too comfortable with people. And it's largely worked, but it can be tricky. To be precise, over the last 27 years, there have been 180 different habituation events. And of those, 146 of them were followed up with some form of hazing. And as Taylor and Doug said, they have only needed to lethally remove two individuals. Really, it's just best to keep wildlife wild, and wolves are no exception. And that means giving them distance, not feeding the wildlife, and reporting to managers as soon as you see a wolf or really any wildlife acting odd or being overly comfortable around people. Coming up, we have one more story for you that involves an oddly acting canine, a back porch, and a really comfy dog bed. If you're enjoying Working Wild U, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to subscribe to Working Wild U wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks. Now back to the show. Welcome back. We've got one more story for you of what happens when wolves and people share space. You may remember Julia from the Lazy EL in our last episode. Her ranch was one of the first places wolves dispersed after their reintroduction in the 90s. And a lot of wolves have been on her place since. But one day, something felt a bit off. I had a big uh, Pyrenees Border Collie cross, but he was kind of a wuss. He was upset, and so I put him in the house and then I looked out to see what he was barking at. And this strange dog came uh, right through here and right past those trees. And I had a dog bed where those chairs are over there underneath the kitchen window. So I could, from the kitchen window, I could look out and watch the whole thing. And when I saw it come up on the porch, it acted just like a dog. It sniffed the bed, it sniffed the water dish, it, walked around and then it curled up on the bed. I said mm, to myself, I think it is a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and for typical wolf behavior, this is obviously really, really odd. 
and it got up off the do dog bed and went over my deck into my vegetable garden, which has a deer fence around it, so it was cornered. So we sat there, what should we do? And uh, called the game warden and asked him what we should do. And he said, if it's up on your porch, there's something wrong with it, you should just shoot it. And if a wolf is that close, you just have to assume something's wrong. So that's what we did. We came back, and it was back on the dog bed, and uh, it ran into the garden again where it was cornered, and it was, it was a very humane and but difficult. And it turned out it had distemper. They, they came and got the carcass and took it to Bozeman and said that it had distemper. Canine distemper is a contagious and serious disease. It's caused by a virus that attacks the respiratory, gastrointestinal, and nervous systems of puppies and dogs. It's a pretty nasty disease that can be spread back and forth between wolves and domesticated dogs if they come into close contact. Yeah, I remember talking to the vet. I was the one that picked it up. That's Abby Nelson, a former Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks wolf specialist and fellow producer of this podcast. And brought it to her. She tested it for distemper and then sent its head away and it had brain lesions, which was from what... From the distemper? Right, from the distemper, which is what is, you know, making it think that this is a normal situation <laughs> or think not like a wolf. All of these stories have some takeaways, and that is direct wolf-human interactions in the wild are really pretty rare, and generally non-typical wolf behavior stems primarily from disease or habituation. And unless a wolf is habituated, you basically have to chase them down with a helicopter if you want to have a close encounter. The real thing to keep in mind here is if you pick up your garbage or secure attractants, as we'll talk about later in this season, then you're not providing a reason for wolves to hang out in human spaces. There's really little opportunity for face-to-face, -face, direct human interaction. Yeah, I get these questions a lot. The rules are pretty simple. Don't feed the wildlife, don't approach the wildlife. And the fact of the matter is, the only reason they're so visible in Yellowstone is that they've gotten used to people at some level. So let's think about tourism opportunities in places like Colorado, which voted by ballot initiative to reintroduce wolves. Is there real opportunity for tourism income in Colorado? I mean, maybe, but not unless there's a place where you want wolves to become habituated at some sort of baseline level to people watching them. And maybe there are a couple of places like that around federally protected lands, like Rocky Mountain National Park. But that won't be a helpful pattern of behavior for ranchers operating in working wild landscapes. In next episode, we're going to go into another aspect of wolf-human interactions, where folks do get pretty close to these animals. Hunting. So stay tuned, because we're going to tackle that rabbit hole head on. State management of wolves and the challenges and opportunities of managing a hunted population. I'll go ahead and acknowledge now that this is a really divisive topic. So I want to take a minute to remind you, our listener, that the goal of this podcast is to find the nuance in what are often polarizing issues. So join us next time for a really thoughtful and challenging conversation. We'll catch you all back soon. Working Wild U is a production of Montana State University Extension and Western Landowners Alliance, with support from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, Western SARE, and listeners like you. Today's episode was directed and edited by Zach Altman and produced by Matthew Collins, Zach Altman, Alex Few, Jared Beaver, and Abby Nelson. Our hosts are Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Lewis Wirtz is our executive producer. Music is from Artlist and Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Grant Cadwallader, Julia Childs, Taylor Bland, Doug Smith, Mike Jimenez, Chet Robertson, and Nick Mott. Follow Working Wild U on social media for updates and explore our show notes and bonus content on our website at workingwild.us. Please consider rating and reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with a friend or neighbor. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.